Do you have any concerns with long-term safety or anything other than simply the economics of the GLP ones in this current generation? Again, <laughs> huge, yeah. huge leap forward between liraglutide and semaglutide. Yeah. And uh, I've discussed briefly elsewhere on the podcast what the roadmap looks like for how many of these drugs are in the pipeline. Oh, yeah. There seems to be no end in sight. <laughs> and we're right. going to look back at semaglutide and say, God, that thing was pedestrian. That's what's going to so, happen. So what, give us the bear case. Yeah. What should we be concerned with? What should we be at least looking out for? Yeah. I would say overall at the present time, uh, I would consider these drugs to be quite safe. The, the major issue is you have to go slow because of the GI toxicity. Where is the controversy involved? And it's something that uh, I'm involved with myself. Uh, when you lose 20 or 30% of your body weight, you lose muscle mass, okay? Uh, now, uh, I just gave a talk on this to one of the pharmaceutical companies that are involved in this area. I'm not gonna name the name of the, the pharmaceutical company. Uh, but I started off uh, by saying, look, here is now a study with real data. This is a, a, a gastric bypass surgery study, room Y bypass. And the people lost, I think it was 33% of their body weight. And their lean body mass came down quite significantly. One of the problems is people may measure lean body mass, and that's not a real measure of muscle mass. In fact, it's, it can be a very bad measure. You should measure muscle mass. But let's assume that the lean body mass largely reflects, it's a reasonable assumption, muscle mass. So muscle mass came down, okay? So why is that so bad? But how much did it come down? Because if your total body mass came down by 33%, yep. but three quarters of that mass was fat, yep. and only one quarter of that was lean, we would consider that acceptable. And this is where the controversy is. Yep because no one has really measured muscle mass. That's right. We're doing it, okay? okay. We, we will have a definitive answer. And you're doing that with MR? MRI, yep. yeah, okay? So it's, it's gold standard, yep. okay? But now, I said, look, in this study, they, they measured absolute strength. You can do grip strength or leg strength. And absolute strength went down a little bit, okay? Maybe 25%. Were these patients exercising during the period no, of no, no. weight loss? No, 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 okay. no. No. Then they said, let's express strength As a, per weight loss. Per weight, yeah. Whew, up by 50%. Per appendicular, yeah. it goes up by 50%. And then they said, how far can they walk? They went from walking 200 yards <laughs> to two miles. And then they said, one of the things is how many times can you get up out of a chair in a certain period of time? It increased like three or four fold. And, and they, they, they measured your VO2 max. Uh, your, yeah, of yeah. course, which is heavily dependent on weight as well. Yeah, it all got better. But in absolute terms, did VO2 max get better? Not necessarily. Yeah. The total VO2, Every, everything, not normalized per kilogram. No, everything got better. Okay. So, uh, so I said, so why you guys- That's so, counterintuitive, by the way. Yeah. Normally when you lose weight, yeah. VO2 max in liters per minute does not improve because you have less metabolic tissue. Right. But, but uh, here, for whatever the reasons yeah. are, maybe all of the fat that's pushing on your lungs so you can't oxygenate, the epicardial fat uh, that's not mm -hmm, allowing mm -hmm. your heart to contract, the fat that's in the heart that's causing uh, myocardial lipotoxicity, yes. which I believe is real. These things are all changing in a positive way. Uh, so again, it's a balance of, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. so uh, of course they don't like this because <laughs> If the people, and they had all kinds of psychological questionnaires. Wait, why weren't they happy with these results? Well, because uh, they, now the companies are all looking at developing drugs that will preserve the muscle mass or increase the muscle mass. But basically what I'm saying is that, look, there's a huge, it's lean body mass, but we have to say it's reflecting muscle mass. Yep. Uh, everything gets better. The patient feels better, they can walk better, they feel stronger, et cetera, et cetera. Why are you so worried about muscle mass? Like I look all these gloomy faces because they're all developing myostatin inhibitors or event. And, and so I, then the next slide comes up and says, retort. Here's a good thing, okay? So now uh, if you uh, lose all of this body weight and you improve insulin sensitivity in muscle uh, and you improve it in the heart uh, and there are cardiovascular benefits and you correct the uh, improvement in all of the cardiovascular risk factors. Now, even though uh, you've 
lost muscle mass, if you've improved insulin sensitivity, there may be an enormous benefit of seeing the improvement in the muscle insulin sensitivity, even though you've lost muscle mass. Uh, and they do have some concerns about these drugs, these myostatin inhibitors that actually may have some negative effects in the heart. And my suggestion is actually, you may find a big improvement in myocardial function uh, from uh, these. Uh, How cl Where are myostatin inhibitors in their development right phase now? Phase two, yeah. yeah. And um, of course, I think we've talked about myostatin before on the podcast. When you inhibit myostatin, you increase the expression of striated muscle, yeah. of which cardiac is striated. It works and through the event in uh, 2A and 2B system. Uh, um, do you think that's a more promising pathway than the follistatin pathway where follistatin- Yes, I do. Increasing, in, increasing follistatin inhibits myostatin, but this is a more direct way to go about it. This yeah. is a more direct way to do it. So you can either have their, their antibodies uh, by Grubab uh, to uh, myostatin, or you can interfere with the signaling uh, receptor itself. And we think that this can still be effective in a fully developed and mature adult. I mean, clearly this would be effective during development. And we see that in the animal work. Yeah. Is it, how effective is it? Because a lot of the animal work is sort of a caricature stuff. It's knockouts, right? They take myostatin knockouts and they look like bodybuilders. Yeah. But if you take a mature chicken or a mouse that's two years old and you give it a myostatin antibody, how robust is the response? Even more so, well, what about in a human? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, we don't know the answer to that. So what the phase two studies, obviously the toxicity passed in, fast, in phase one. Yes, yeah. I, I, I'm not concerned. There, there, there doesn't seem to be any adverse effect of these drugs or they wouldn't got through phase two. And there are actually s some fairly large phase What's two What's the indication? The indication- Is it sarcopenia? I, I don't know. I'm, I, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the FDA, if you have a sarcopenic disease, there are criteria that the FDA has established if you want to develop a drug that you have to meet certain criteria. I'm not an expert in this, mm -hmm. so I, I can't tell you exactly what these criteria are, but they are, pretty well established, okay? Uh, let's say I put you on a GLP-1 receptor agonist and you lost 25% of your body weight. And I put you on a myostatin inhibitor and that prevented the muscle loss. Didn't increase it, but just prevented it. So relatively- But that would be ridiculous. I mean, if you took a 200 pound individual yeah. who's 30% body fat, yeah. So they they've they've got 60 pounds of adipose tissue on them. Yep. If you took 25% of their body weight yep. off, you take them down to 150 pounds, but you're telling me potentially we prevent any deterioration of lean mass. Yeah. That means they're down to 10 pounds of fat mass on a 150 pound yep. frame. So I'm making an assumption. Okay. This okay. is pretty radical. This is, this is remarkable. Pr right. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say that happened. Yeah. Okay. What would be the FDA's criteria, I'm gonna give you approval for this drug. I think the FDA would ask that you've also improved function in some way. Yes. And the function would probably be ha have to be determined through absolute strength, not relative strength, yeah. would be my guess. So I, I don't know the answer to this question. Because the way I think about these drugs is less about that situation. Uh, it's more in the, it's more in the sarcopenic adult. This is the lean, particularly the older person. That's right, that's right. This is the elderly individual who's sarcopenic and yes. whose fall risk yes. is enormous. Yes. And their risk of fall and uh, morbidity and mortality is very high. Yeah. And in that individual, I don't think the FDA will be satisfied with simply an increase in lean body mass unless it is accompanied yeah. by strength. Now, I think that some of the tests that are used here are silly. I think the six minute walk test should be folded up, discarded, <laughs> put in the waste basket and never discussed again. It is such a stupid test. They do it all the time. I know they do. In and it just makes me want to scream. <laughs> yeah. We need much more rigorous tests than yeah. a six minute walk test. We need a test that is actually uh, more of a submaximal test. 
So if we're testing cardiorespiratory fitness or some sort of peak aerobic fitness, we have to do more than walking. And if we're testing strength, I much prefer grip strength, leg extension, bench press. Uh, yeah, again, these can be done with machines. They can be done very safely, but we really need to test yeah. strength. Well, you see, you're raising very important and critical issues because there are many, many companies that are going ahead with these drugs <clears throat> that in, in, increase muscle mass. But to me, okay, increasing muscle mass, what does that mean? There needs to be some functional translation of that. And, and by the way, there could be other functional benefits that exceed strength. For example, glucose disposal could be a functional insulin benefit. Insulin sensitivity, that's the one that's I right. put at the top of the list. That's for right. It, get rid of the insulin resistance. That The FDA won't give them credit for that, I don't think. Yeah, but but I think that Again, it's harder to tease out because there's more moving pieces and they might argue there are easier ways to increase insulin sensitivity and glucose disposal. But, you know, one way to think about this is to go back to what if you did it the old fashioned way? What if you got in the gym and lifted a bunch of weights? That's been done. Yeah. And it increases insulin sensitivity Absolutely. and functional strength. Absolutely. And so the question is, can we replicate that pharmacologically? Uh, and that is actually exactly the way I ended my discussion to these people. I showed them what resistance training did. And if you could show what resistance training did uh, with your muscle mass uh, increase, then you'd have something. But you need to design the studies appropriately. And as I said, and as you said, I, I, I don't know what the criteria are going to be that the mm -hmm. FDA uses to judge these things. They do have a sarcopenia set of criteria, but that's a very different group of people that we're talking about. Yeah. But this comes... Uh, and hits home to one of the things you asked me earlier. What about the lean person who's 80 years of age? Is this the right drug for that person? I don't know, uh, maybe not. But now let's say you have a healthy 80 year old person and everybody in the family lives to be 105 and they have diabetes. Well, they're at risk to, you know, uh, the toxic effects of hyperglycemia. Uh, would it be reasonable to treat uh, that person? We know this powerful effects on the beta cell. I would say it would be quite reasonable, but I think you need to monitor what's happening to their weight and other features.